welcome you tonight to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood, which is the uh, Tuesday night conversation of Past to Understanding, which is uh, formerly Neighbors in Faith and the Tracy Levine Center. Our mission at Past to Understanding is bridging bias and building unity through multi-faith peacemaking. We're happy to have you all join us tonight and especially happy to have Anthony Young, who's an entrepreneur and educator and believes in inclusiveness and is willing to work for it and is also on the city council uh, in Anacortes, Washington. Uh, Keiko McCracken, who works for the Anacortes School District, uh, worked for a while in community engagement, is now working in special ed, um, and whose children are fourth generation Anacortesans. I've never said that word before, but I said uh, it pretty well. Sure. And, then, and then Amy Hong, a financial advisor at Barrett Financial, um, has two, two young boys and has lived in large and small towns and is currently living in Anacortes. And I'm just so happy to be on with all of you tonight. Thank you all for being with me and, and with all of us here who, who, are, who are in conversation together. And I just want everybody to know tonight that um, if, you're, if you're on Zoom, you can ask a question in the Q&A function. And if you're on Facebook, uh, you can ask a question in the comments and we'll, we'll endeavor to respond to those questions as we're able to do. So at first, I just want to ask, um, how you all are doing in the middle of, you know, COVID-19 and the shutdown and all the uncertainty. And I I'm wondering, Keiko, if you'd be willing to start. Yeah. Um, so our family, you know, it's such a strange time, right? And what I've been reflecting on is, is the way in which this time together has kind of intensified family life in a, a way that, you know, we're not really used to, um, being with each other in in these uh, kind of you know extended ways and um so it's really interesting how it's kind of uh you know intensified but also kind of glorified you know so our bond together and how we're just navigating that internal space as well as just going to the store and you know all of the things that we have to do to adjust to quarantine but it's been the family space that's been most interesting to me to watch those dynamics. That's great, thank you. Uh, Anthony, how about you? How are you doing? You know, I'm adjusting. I'm, I'm a self-starter and you know, I've always had a home office, but I think what has changed is the idea of not being able to go out and socialize at will or whenever my schedule allows me to sort of go out and have this intellectual, cultural retreat conversation with people. And so that's been limiting. And because my spouse is in medicine, um, you know, the dynamic of protecting our house and us from the virus has been hard in the sense that we had to implement our own protocols here at the house to ensure that the virus doesn't walk in with it that, you know, there are protocols in place. So, you know, it's a little bewildering, but at the same time, I'm like uh, Keiko in that our time and our conversations are strong. Uh, the things that we do as a family is more connecting and reaffirming. And so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's unusual, but all in all, I'm learning to adjust and our house is moving forward. Thank you. Amy, how about you? Well, I just echo what Anthony and Keiko are saying. I mean, this is a hopefully once in a lifetime yeah. experience. And for me, my focus has really been about how to, to make this time something that my children will look back on with fond memories, as opposed to it being a traumatic experience. And although there's been no playbook and everything from school to work to play, um, and beyond has been completely unique. It's It's been a time for us to come together as a family and build those memories and um, and kind of realize what's important and what's not. Oh, yeah. and, and at this point, it's for me, just really the wonderment of what life is gonna look like on the other side. I mean, I think we've been quarantined and in isolation long enough that we've kind of got a little bit of a routine at this point but it's, it's beyond that and in a month or in two months and, and beyond what is, what is our life going to look like? And that's, that's been the struggle for me. Yeah. I know for myself, I, as I said to you all earlier that, um, 
I, I sort of hit the uh, the adaptation exhaustion point last week, um, and just you know all the different uh, habits that that are no longer that no longer work just right, and uh, and so having to constantly rethink everyday routines and patterns, and and uh, is is really something really really exhausting, and I think. Um, to part of what to what you said, Amy, thinking about what comes next, because it's not going to be a snapback to the old normal. There's going to be a, a hybrid model, and then it's going to change periodically. And I think to give ourselves space to honor that those those moments of discomfort and tiredness that that come with that are going to be really important um, for for all of us. Absolutely. You know, uh, so Anthony, what what brought you and your family to to Anacortes, and and what do you like about this place? Oh boy, um, you know, we came. We had friends here. My spouse again is in medicine, and so he had um, friends that he went through residency with that husband wife surgical team, and so we for. 15 years or so, we listened to the kids growing up, all of the wonderful stuff of this area. And we always heard that thing, if ever you decide to leave the area we were in to give us a shot. And uh, we came out uh, when we had done all we could do in the on the East Coast and were looking for a place that we could build a sense of family because we collect people and um, eventually retire there. And so we came out and um, fell in love with the place. Uh, I think for me, the challenge was in being um, brown, uh, in the lack of brown people here, you know, being from the South, I needed to make sure that it would work for me. I was clear that it could work for him because it was just such an enveloping place. And to my surprise, it really exceeded my expectation. I kept waiting for a shoe to drop that never dropped. Uh, you know, of course, the reality of life and different cultures made it um, a place that I know I can, I love, but one that I know that I have to work with such that it understands who we all are as a collective of diverse people and diverse thoughts. So not only was it, is it something, some place that I truly like and love living here, but I also knew it was an opportunity to teach and to share other thoughts and other cultures such that we all are rich. Amen. And, and so Keiko, I mean, how about you? Uh, how long have you been around Anacortes and, and uh, what's it been like for you? Yeah, so I, um, so my husband, um, and you mentioned this, actually, uh, my kids are fifth generation anacortisans, and so oh, my sorry. husband grew up on Guimas, which is an island right, you know, off the coast of Anacortes, and so I came here with him in the early 80s, and we lived on the island for many years, and now we call ourselves expats, we live, you know, seven minute ferry wide away from the island, yeah. um, but it, when I came um, to Anacortes and to Guimas, it was a really different time for the town. Lots of empty storefronts, um, you know, kind of in the last dying days of the um, heyday of the mills and the fishing and all of that. And so Anacortes was really struggling to reinvent itself. Um, but that didn't take place for a number of years after, you know, I arrived. So I arrived to a very sleepy, you know, very sleepy town and um, sleepier island. Uh, really kind of, yeah, kind of the last days before Anacortes and the San Juans were, you know, so-called so discovered. Um, so. Wow. And Amy, how about you? So we've lived here a little over five years now, and we moved here from the Bay Area because California and the Bay Area was just getting too congested, too expensive. I mean, all the, the reasons you hear about California. And so my husband got a call from a headhunter and talking about a small town right outside Seattle. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and so we, we flew up and... Yeah. 
drove up to Anacortes and ne had never heard of it. Didn't really even know what the San Juan Islands were. I mean, heard of it in passing, but not familiar with it and just immediately fell in love. And it, it was it was at a time where the boys were young enough where we figured, hey, we go and we try it out. And if we hate it, we move back or we move somewhere else and it's okay. And I think a lot of the reasons that we loved it are also have been some of the the negatives as well. I mean, we liked that it was a, a small kind of idyllic, sleepy seaside town. Um, but at the same time, our big concern was the lack of diversity. Yeah. And um, not only in people, but also, you know, restaurants and ethnic foods and all those things that you get, right, in the Bay Area, right. in New York City and other places yeah. that my husband and I had lived. And so, um, so yeah, so we've been here five years and have really loved it. I mean, I think like any place, it's not perfect. And we've had to, our own struggles as being a family of being Asian American and one of the the few, you know, fully Asian American families in town. And um and it's just been, it, it's a wonderful town and we're here to stay, but you know, it's, it's, it's not perfect either. Yeah. So let's just, you know, kind of get right into, you know, some of the, we've had some, you know, some talk about the positive experiences mm -hmm. um, in Anacortes, but what have been some of the, the challenges, um, or especially, especially related to race? In Anacortes. And, yeah. and Anthony, I'm wondering if you might be willing to go first on this one. Well, you, you know, Terry, I've never been one to mince words. And what I'm honored to be <laughs> is um, uh, having this conversation with three people I really do value um, deeply in their vision for how we go forward. But the challenge is, is more to do, it's a wonderful town, absolutely friendly people. Um, I, it's like a Mayberry. And in many ways, I remind people that even in Mayberry, Barney Fife carried one bullet. And so the thing about this town is that we have wonderful people, but there are challenges. There are system systems in place that are naturalized, which they are, and they are efficiently running forward. Yes, they are. But the challenge we face is that in recognizing that even in Anacortes, our be beautiful, beloved town, there are groups of diverse people here. And my goal and my hope is that we can bring them, as I like to say, out of the shadows and into the street. Because, you know, there's a history associated with people who were here. Asians were here. They were brought to work and they were. Natives were here and they're part of the culture and who we are, trying to make sure that everyone's at the table and at least their voice being heard in the decisions that are being made to affect us all. That is the challenge because what you have are wonderful people that sometimes don't realize that their normal processes exclude others and that it needs to be a greater effort to make sure all of our culture at the table. And I think that that's where the differences lies because it's hard to convince people that their processes, albeit they working, is resulting in exclusion for others because they're trying to see your point of view from inside the bubble. And what we're trying to say is that we're used to working both in the bubble and living outside of the bubble. And we understand that there's a path forward such that we can, uh, to the betterment of our town, uh, are working together. So that's been, I think, a challenge and sometimes both disheartening because it requires so much energy to try to convey a differing point of view where you may have not only cultural biases, mm -hmm. but um, stereotypical misunderstandings of others and realizing that this norm that we are creating is a collection of all of us, not just one of us. And so that's what we're working for and that's what I'm working for. Yeah, so Amy, I, I would ask you the same question. What have been some of the, the experiences you've had around or challenges you've had around, around race in Anacortes? So I come from a different lens because I have young school children. I have an elementary school child and a middle school child. Um, I would say 
when we first moved into town, the first week that we were here, we were downtown and went into a shop and there was uh, an incident where we were blatantly discriminated against. Um, my child needed to use the restroom and we were told that, you, you know, wasn't allowed. And, and then subsequent customers came in who were all people, you know, white skin and they were all used, allowed to use the restroom. And so that was our introduction to the wow. town was not a great, you know, first inter introduction. And I raised a stink, right? So I'm not one to, because initially if someone, if the shopkeeper tells you that you can't use the restroom and it's not open to the public, then you accept that as policy. But when you see that that's not the case, then, you know, that's just blatant discrimination. And so I raised a stink and I, you know, and I loudly confronted the shopkeeper and um, with my, my children there standing next to me, and, um, and, you know, once confronted, she was very apologetic and just very um, flustered, I would say. And I think it was because she was called out in such a public way. I think if we had just left, she probably, you know, wouldn't have thought twice about it. But because she was immediately called out upon seeing that, um, she was really flustered and didn't really know what to say and was not able to really come back in a way that, you know, that made it okay. And so that was not a great experience. And that was our, you know, first really blatant, blatant discriminatory um, event in town. Now I will say that since then that nothing like that has happened. And so that to me is a, is a very one-off, right? Not of the norm event for this town. But I would say my children at school have been bullied due to being Asian American. Mm -hmm. They constantly being thing, having things said to them. You know, COVID has brought another layer of bullying against uh, yeah. Asians and Asian Americans. Um, so, because they're on the schoolyard and they're with children, it is it is a fact of of their you know life. It's not an everyday all the time in your face type of thing, but it's it's certainly something that they are made aware of on a regular basis, and they they understand that it's you know. It's something that people will point out or, you know, make sure that they feel like or know that they're different. Um, I don't know. I don't think that that's necessarily that much different in other schoolyards or different larger communities or, right? I mean, it's, it, it happens everywhere. Discrimination can happen everywhere. And just like di diversity is really everywhere as well. Absolutely. Um, but, but that's been our experience on the whole. I mean, it's a wonderful town, but it, it is a small town and it, it is, it does lack cultural and ethnic diversity. And, and so, you know, we can, we write, we try to do our part. And my, my take has always been, you call it out. And my raised my husband and I have both raised our children so that immediately you call it out, you, you name it, you call it out, you, you know, you stand, you stand your ground. And I think that's worked well in terms of in, in the school district, school administrators and teachers have always been very, very supportive if we've ever gone to them about issues. It's been interesting because parents um, can run the spectrum, right? Some are very, very open and, and accepting and, and want to hear that and others don't at all and don't want to be confronted with any anything ugly or, you know, what they believe is not being an issue. And so so that's been interesting too. Can I ask one question as you were, and I know that you were moving on, but, you know, Amy, as you were talking, I've seen you before confront uh, issues that are appropriately needing to be confronted because it's an education process, not only for the children, but it's an education process for them. And what I really appreciate about you, not only as a mother, but a smart woman, the family, is that you want your children to bear witness and understand what's taking place. Would you elaborate a little bit as to why that's important? Well, I think all of this are, you know, teach by example moments. And children in particular learn by the actions of the, the adults around them, whether it be action or lack of action. And so for me, it's been um, really critical because one of the stereotypes of Asians in particular is the model minority myth, right? And that they are more silent and they, they don't, right? Um, 
immediately confront or immediately, uh, whether that be true or not, that is the stereotype. And, and so, and especially I have two boys and so they, they come with the other <laughs> Asian male stereotype baggage as well. And so for me, it, it's just really important. Everything that we do is for my husband and I very, in a, in a very conscious way of how do we teach by example to, um, to make sure that they don't grow up with a chip on their shoulder, but also understand right how, um, how to bring that, that love and warmth out into their own communies. And Keiko, how about you? What's been your experience with yeah, race? Yeah, so race? I would say, um, you know, early on, um, definitely uh, overt, uh, you know, incidents of racism, clerks who wouldn't serve, clerks who wouldn't touch my hand to give me, you know, my change back, um, being followed in uh, stores, places that I would never go uh, you know, I, I've said this to others, like, as uh, someone who is not white, I am constantly assessing what is the threat level of a new yes. situation, yes. a new store, Absolutely. a new restaurant, when I'm traveling, Absolutely. you know, is this yeah. safe? Can I go there? Um, there are places I would never go. Uh, but for the presence of my husband, who's, you know, a 6'3", green-eyed Irish male. Um, but I know that he is my passport to certain situations that I could not get in myself. Absolutely. But I would say in terms of Anacortes, you know, what I, um, well, I'll, t I'll say two things. One is that, you know, I really appreciate what um, Amy is saying about raising children who will stand for others and for my family um, my children for the most part three of the four can pass as white and so what I have said to them is it is even more important because they yes. have the choice yes. us and they do um, but because that choice is available to them, how important it is, how vitally important it is that they do stand up, they do call out, and they choose that harder uh, identity that Absolutely. they, you know, they could hide if they if they chose that. Um, but what I I you know for me that the experience of Anacortes. What I worry about in a small town is that while overt racism rarely shows itself, a small town is much more prone to um, present those same ideas in a much more polite format that is much harder to combat, really. Um, you know, and, and this is, I think, what you know is kind of central to our conversation is what do you how do you talk about race racism and bigotry in a town which prides itself and rightly so to some degree on civility politeness um, color blindness yeah. and, all oh, of yeah. That. and yeah. so and so what we're left with is you know to quote uh, a certain leader right now, the invisible enemy, right? Like it's right, yeah. there and we all know it, but it's, it's dressed up in such a way that it just makes it really tough to, you know, have those uh, conversations and for people to know. And, and one of the things, um, one of the books I'm reading now, which is sort of turning my head around um, it's Ibram Kendi's work. Uh, he's got several books. One is called Stamp from the Beginning. And his premise, which is, it took me like 12 times to grasp it, is that it isn't the overt hatred. It isn't ignorance and it's not hate. Those are not at the basis of inequality. Those are outcomes, mm -hmm. but they're not the basis. The basis is policy. The basis is that a goal is set, you know, 
I want to uh, increase my wealth. How am I going to do that? I want to have slaves. How can I have slaves? I need to come up with a rationale for why black people and brown people are not my equal. Once I have that in place, the hatred and you know the discrimination will flow from that. But the basis is policy, which it was a new thought for me. You know, I'm it it it's it sort of it's very counterintuitive. And yet, if you look at, for instance, in this administration, what has drawn um, what the, that administration has drawn power from, you could say they're racist, but you could also say they're using racism as a mm. way to accrue power and to keep power. And so I think we always have to have that in central in our mind is what policy is the racist thought protecting or engendering in some way? Yeah, I think you bring up you know such an important point, and 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 often in these conversations we don't really stop and talk about how we define racism, mm -hmm. right? And, and kind of how racism manifests. And and I always appreciate a um, a, a viewpoint that understands that racism is is both is some kind of bias uh, for or against uh, a particular group of people that's internalized. In, 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 in all of us in some way, it's it's expressed in terms of interpersonal relationships and how we relate to each other individually or, or as small groups. It also gets expressed by institutions, you know, mm -hmm. banks and schools and uh, city councils and uh, civic groups and that sort of thing, Absolutely. churches, of course. Um, and then it's also, it's also expressed institutionally or excuse me, excuse me structurally which is like the compilation of all those institutions Absolutely. along with policy and mm -hmm. along with national narratives that, that, that then kind of name what we're about. Um, for instance, uh, the, the one about manifest destiny, that, that the United States was a promised land that, that white people had the, had the right and in fact the responsibility to cast out Native Americans yeah. <laughs> from this land. And of course, there was a policy behind that. There was a policy goal yeah. behind that. Right. Um, and then, uh, and then, of course, there's all the repercussions that come from it. Um, you know, this last summer, I know we had a, a pretty terrible incident in Anacortes. Um, I was up at Holden Village uh, with very poor internet connectivity uh, when I got a, a note from Anthony, a text from him uh, about uh, a noose that was hung on a madrone tree in or madrona tree in uh, Cap Sandy Park, which if you're not from Anacortes is, is the big rock you can see kind of from downtown and that you can drive up on top of. Um, and uh, I just knew I had to come home. So I came home uh, then and, and it began kind of a conversation um, with the city and with the city council about what to do about that. Um, so Anthony, I'd be curious to hear your kind of telling of that story briefly. Wow. <clears throat> Ooh, that was heavy one. Uh, I think because, because what it forces, as uh, Keiko and Amy has said, and you, uh, it forces you to confront in a discussion among intelligent, good people, a difficult issue. And the hard part is trying to get people who can distance themselves from it. It's sort of like social distancing now using that same concept, what they try to do is push away from it because it means confronting a bit of ugliness. And then if it pricks the heart, what it requires as a, a person is for you to try to reach some resolve about it. And so when that happened, I was approached by some sitting on council. I had some constituents call me, tell me about it, show me a picture. And my first thought was, wow, um, the shoe has dropped here in Anacortes. You know, the ugliness comes out. But I also knew that I needed to, it was days um, <clears throat> before what we were having was a shipwreck day. And at that shipwreck day, there were also swastikas for sale. And um, so it was this, felt like this concerted effort. I called the mayor and text the mayor and she immediately reacted, but she sent out the park person to take it down. In my conversation with a number of wonderful people here in town, 
everyone kept hoping to attribute it to a, a, a kid expressing himself. And, and if you can follow that thought of a child expressing himself, acting out, doing something um, edgy, for me and others like me, the thought that a child would do such an act indicated that there were other issues at play and that it was okay to express themselves in this fashion. Someone tried to also give it an easy out by saying maybe someone thought about suicide. Well, you know, sometimes I, it's rare in my opinion, I'm not a doctor, that suicides are that much of a display. This was intending as a message. And quite honestly, the news is more than just a noose. It really is a symbol of oppression, a threat by its very nature for people intending to cast a message. So in the fact then that two days later, there was the swastika for sale. And when this one great guy here, I'm assuming he's Irish, but he's a local guy, Willie came up to me, I happened to be with uh, the deputy prosecutor walking down uh, perusing the aisles and he came up to her because she had a vest on uh, indicating she's a helper and he said to her he was so upset he talked to the person and the person was supposed to be selling it but actually when he finally realized that the guy really wasn't selling he said hey I want to buy it I'll pay you whatever it is you want the guy didn't want to sell it to him and so they ended up in, a, in an argument and I could applaud him but the issue was, it was deliberately on, split, on display, mm -hmm. deciding to incite those that believe a certain way. And um, so it was offensive, but the hard part was conveying it to all of our beloved people that this is, this, even though it, it's an act that we don't like, it's also an indication that we've got work to do here in this town to make sure everyone understands our policy. And so that led to work on what we ended up um, doing is resolution 2060 in the city. And that again was difficult because there were people who felt, don't bring it up anymore, Tony. Just ignore it, don't give oxygen and air to it. The problem with not giving oxygen and air to it is that it is a direct threat. And that is not as if you have someone around that you can suddenly see that they're wearing that color so you know that there's a threat and you can get away from them. These are silent people who will attack you for no reason other than who you are culturally and the pigments of your skin. So we had to push, and it was a difficult time for the council, it really was, but they did do the right thing. It ended up being a six to one vote with your help, with you know all of you here on the on, on this panel, Keiko, Amy, Terry, we all were talking, and we and and um, thank you, Terry, for lending your voice. So it's not just people of color bringing up the ugliness of racism, because in some ways society expects you to do that, and it diminishes the claim just a little bit, and it sort of gives an out. And so anyway, that was one of the hardest things I had to do and, and to try to also separate the emotion of a child growing up in the 60s in the South, seeing crosses burning, knowing and seeing, having seen someone who were the remains on TV of someone that was hanged. So it wasn't a hollow threat. It was very clear what the intentions was and the message was received. I was just simply hoping that all people of good nature that believe in each other, that believe that we are one, that everybody's got a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, regardless of who you are, that that would rise forward and bring forward a number of people to help take action. But again, it was challenging because you know there were those who um, felt that it crossed with um, freedom of speech. But the, there's a difference between freedom of speech and hate speech. There's a difference between having the right to, to your viewpoint 
but yet using that viewpoint to intimidate me, harm me, and to threaten me with unknown assailants that we've proven by the number of assassinations we've had across the country gun violence kids being slaughtered, that this is not a hollow threat. The possibility is real. Yeah, there's there's at least 50, 50 at least fifty thousand uh, African Americans were 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 brutally killed and and you know on 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 by nooses. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, millions be, terrified. Amy, go ahead. I mean to be clear, a hanging noose in a tree is a hate crime. And the fact that there was even any debate and even hesitation from our city government and representation and people in leadership was disappointing to me. So where I, I'm coming from on this is I saw that happening and I, I kind of sat back and waited because I wanted to see what the response was going to be, right? And um, my family knew about it. We talked about it over dinner. We knew what was going on, but we were, we were really just sitting back and seeing what was going to happen. And really, and, you know, I, I think to some de degree, so was the perpetrator, right? Absolutely. The perpetrator yeah. was sitting back and waiting because these, these overt uh, crimes are a way of testing the community. What's allowable? What can, you know, what can happen here? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, uh, you know, what, to Amy's point, what was disappointing about some of the pushback and this is really where you see white supremacy is that white supremacy is always about removing context and removing history and looking at it as if, you know, as one person said, they didn't like kale, right? Was that a hate crime to not like kale? So when you equivocate, when you remove context in history, um, then it gives you that chance to talk about it as if it were like something very innocuous mm -hmm. and so i think this is you know what i was so proud of with this group and and with the council members who did vote um in the right way in the end is that they rejected that equivocation and that uh just stripping of meaning uh, mm -hmm. from a symbol that is so clearly a symbol of hate yeah well i think that again this was another teach by example moment and I think that early on, that moment was missed by several people in leadership. And I think that um, early missteps like that can heighten tension and discord. And when I saw that there was really no response or no appropriate response, I mean, this, this was an opportunity to quickly mm -hmm. and adamantly strike it down and call it for what it is and and state that there's no room for that in our town and when that wasn't happening that's when i realized that where this was going and i reached out to anthony and i said okay what what can we do because it's not being brought to the forefront in the way it should be and it's not being addressed in the way it should be and so anthony was wrote this resolution and you know it it turned out wonderfully and, um, you know, I applaud Anthony and his hard work and his efforts, but I think that was really disappointing to me. And I understand where a lot of people were coming from in our town. There is a fear of, well, no, that's not, that's not the case here, right? People aren't racist and anacortist. No, 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 that's not what they meant. They meant suicide. They meant this. Don't call it what it is because then that gives that per the perpetrator attention. There was a lot of that pushback because it's that fear. And yeah. why do you want to bring this up? You know, can't we let it go and forget right. about it? And, and let's yeah. move forward. You were dealing it with it, you know, the most. You were dealing with that pushback on, you know, daily. It, it hurt, I think, because as a council person, I had to separate my as much of my emotion as I could. Mm -hmm and to not be combative in trying to bring forward an issue that was so emotionally wrought with pain, legacy, historic legacy, you know, and trying to explain to someone and, and to ga gauge and get their support for a declaration for a city that is as um, wonderful as our city. But, right. but again, that still speaks to that need for education and the need for this group 
to come forward and, and to begin the process of having these discussions. I mean, quite honestly, I think our city is well run. It really is. Here's the challenge that I, as a council person, um, uh, I'm, we have a wonderful city. And if I'm correct, and I'm not sure, I think we have three people, two people of color working for the city out of 200 and something employees. Okay. And so not for the sake of hiring people of color, it's the fact that we do have competent people, but I'm sure that there are other competent people out here that allows as a community to represent the face of this world. Um, you know, again, I think it's important because the children that we're educating, just like you were saying, Amy, and just like you did, Tato, is that if we are educating our children to stay here on this island, don't embrace the world. It might be great for them given some of the demographics, but the moment that they step foot off this island, right. it all changes. Yeah. And so we, they won't be prepared for the wonderfulness of, of different cultures that have made this country what it is. And we've got to find a way to educate them about us and all of us, because I believe we're more educated about them. And I, and I hate that delineation, but you know I'm trying to make a point culturally that right. we walk in two worlds. Yeah. And what we're yeah. trying to say to the larger community is that hear us out, open your heart, and reach out because we're reaching out for you too. Well, and I think you know to um, your point, Anthony. You know the the incident with the news and and that that argument of oh this isn't who we are. Well, actually, it is who we are. Yeah, I know, the question I know. is, who do we wish to become, right? Yeah. And so that, you know, just that whole kind of let's gloss over it with right. um, civility, politeness, let's not talk about it. Right. It's not who we are. But in right. fact, this was, we birthed this, right? Yep. We birthed that incident. And so it's really important to not be afraid to say, wow. This is who, this is what we created, but who do we wish to become? And I think yeah, I what's much more about who do we wish to become yes. in the future? And I think and it goes, it goes, Anthony, exactly what you're saying about two out of the 200 in our city government is people of color. It's exactly the same in the school district and the people who are uh -huh. teaching our children yeah. is there are very few people of color who are yeah, absolutely in the school district. And, yeah. and there's, there's a couple different pieces to that. One is that it's, it's difficult to hire people who are not applying. They're just not applying to come right work if they're a person of color to, to, to be a teacher in Anacortes school district. And I understand that, but there is a responsibility, particularly in the school district to go out and find that right. talent, to go out and find that diversity. <clears throat> For the teacher pool and the administration pool and and you know to work and represent and lead and teach our children and so but if I you but if you but i'm sorry you don't get so fired up yeah. but if you only do what you've always done you should expect yes. the same results and it's not an issue of quality we're not talking about quality yeah. we're yeah. trying to address the issue of yeah. diversity so that means you have to really reach out and exactly. then when you do when someone comes here of diverse hues, you get, you normally have about 24 hours to scan the place, try to see who can live here, have your meeting, and you realize that you see two of people that look like you. Mm -hmm. And I think that it sort of skews the beauty of this area. That's why this group formation was so important. Because in some ways, it also lends us to give the semblance of a village to envelop, to help you culturally through our network of diverse people. We are willing to do that for this town. And that's what our attempt and part of our goal as we go through all of the pain of coming together and talking about these issues, but it really has bonded us. So I apologize for inter interrupting, but it's just so important. Well, I think, you know, too, um, you know, when it comes to education and it comes when it comes to attracting 
a diverse applicant pool, we have to be able to offer them something in that educational yeah. world that is attractive. And what I see, what the, the real struggle that I see in the district that I'm really hoping, um, you know, there is a developing awareness about is that one approach to equity is through the social emotional lens. And I don't want to discredit that movement. I think it's really important, but it also is an off-road to actual equity because Absolutely. if the focus is, well, we just need to be kinder to, you know, the brown child in the corner, if only we understood how, you know, that that child's um, that child comes from a difficult family situation, it, it's a charity model of equity. It doesn't require any change in curriculum. It doesn't require that history is taught in any different way, that other stories are brought forward, that the English curriculum is more than, you know, if, if we only are centered around Shakespeare, which I don't think we are, but you know, you get my point, then, then you, you're not providing a worldview that is necessarily attractive Absolutely. applicants um, of color or of, you know, diverse backgrounds. And so I think that's the next step for the district is to I say, think so. and the city so and the organizations. That's right. Yeah. But we need to move beyond that. Yeah. And we need to look deeply at curriculum mm -hmm. and we need to, you know, uh, really understand what we're trying to help a child. Are we really only trying to help them adapt to the system that is? Mm -hmm. so, that, so that story that that would you know the, the question is when did history begin right huh. on this island right. when did right. history begin and uh because the way you tell that story impacts is really a structural element of racism if history begins in 1880 um, then you're really telling a story right. that, that excludes 10,000, at least 10,000 years of history. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And allows us to avoid the, 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 the terrible displacement of our indigenous sisters and brothers. Yes. You know, Terry, to your, to your point, though, you know, one of the, um, there's a, a question and answer, and I was just sort of scanning down and I saw a person, uh, I think the name was Liz, saying, um, she really, uh, really appreciate the thought of who do we wish to become. And the thing about it is to Keiko's point about the curriculum being an example, you know, whether it's cultural training, sensitivity training by the city, which we've been pushed, trying to push forward, or this, the school system, you know, it's in asking the question, who do we wish to become? The other question we have to answer in our curriculum is training is that we have to stop teaching the continual lies or distortions of the true history of the country. It's a oh wonderful book called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Uh, is It's when we begin as a society to really address the multi-ethnic heritage of our beautiful country and teach that, we will ingrain all of our people in this, this, this sense of belonging and place such that children of differing hues will be at the table because that is the future, whether we want it or not. You know, so just a, a couple of things before we get to a question by Stacy here. Um, okay. Uh, but I, I just want to say, like, I, I want listeners to know who aren't from Anacortes, you can go and look up Resolution 2060 and encourage you to do that. And there are some really great folk on the council that worked on that on that resolution. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Anthony didn't have a lot to do with that. I didn't have a, yeah, I've been meaning to get to that. You know, I think we came up with some original yeah. points that we thought were important. Yes. But the good part about the uh, Anacortes uh, City Council and the members that we had on and Terry working with, um, you know, mm -hmm. some of our members really worked incredibly hard. Mm -hmm. And they came up with the language and the wording I looked over it to make sure there were nothing, you know, just it really hit the points that were important. Because again, it's hard when you are part of that policy trying to make a decision yeah. in the middle of trying to argue for why this is the right thing to do mm -hmm. and leap over all those hurdles of not wanting to deal with the ugliness 
of it all. So yes, thank you, Terry, yeah. for that correction. Oh, oh yeah, and I just want to say too that that really the, what the resolution really was about, it, it was it wasn't encouraging the city to use its its administrative power against someone. No. Yeah. because they held, held a certain view or said something out loud. It was that the city a council and the mayor were, were resolved to speak out, to use their free speech to counter the, the free speech of people who were, who were generating, um, who, who were um, uh, expressing bias against a group and, uh, and, and uh, encouraging a kind of harm against against that group. And so it, it, it wasn't really about the city trying to take away someone's cable, no. you know, if they uh, if they say yeah. something bad. No. Um, it, it was really about the use of free speech by our leaders. So one of the questions here is from Stacy and um, Stacy says that she has a, a, a son um, who's who's Asian American and um, and he um, it really the the heart of the question is how and this is mostly to you, Keiko and Amy, how do you prepare yourself and your children for these kind of experiences? What kind of conversation do you have uh, with your kids to help prepare them for what they may experience? I know, I know for my part, you know, I, um, I really, oh, I'll tell you a little story. So I was at a, a conference and a Lummi elder, a woman spoke and she talked about um, she talked about her grandmother and her grandmother who had been you know forced into boarding schools and had that whole horrific experience and the granddaughter her granddaughter was named for the grandmother and she said in that way i redeem my grandmother every day and so for my family i talk a lot about my mother and my aunties and how important it is that we hold the door open, not just for our children, Absolutely. but for our ancestors to walk through Absolutely. peace and pride. Absolutely. And so that's kind of my message to my children is that this is about not just who you will be and who you will hold the door open for, but also that redemption of the past. So that's always been my message of just how important it is that they use everything they can to keep wedge open that door and keep it open so that others can pass. Absolutely. Yeah. Amy, how about you? Well, I think for me, I've really tried to emphasize to my children recognizing the difference between ignorance and racism, because especially among young children, and I don't know how young, I think you said elementary school, Stacy's child was in elementary school, mm -hmm. but particularly among younger Definitely. children, it's not always steeped in, in hatred, <laughs> the comments that they might make, right? <laughs> so for instance, you know, my son might get a comment from a classmate or someone on the playground who says, why are your eyes so small, right? And it's yeah. not necessarily because that person yeah. hates my son, it's because well, one, we do have small eyes and they're wondering. <laughs> But right, so there's that difference. And, and that extrapolates out to every, anyone of any age, right? That yeah. difference between just ignorance yeah. and discrimination and hatred. So that's, that's something that we're constantly talking about with our children. I think it's just interesting that in a school district or at a particular school, there are very specific plans and protocols mm -hmm. in place for things like medical emergencies or weapons possession. Mm -hmm. But in terms of racist, you know, speech or hate speech or bullying in that sense, um, there isn't. And a lot of what I've is experienced is that it's stuff that administrators or teachers create on the fly, mm -hmm. right? And like, um, and that doesn't work. That really doesn't work. And I think that this is too complex to do on the fly and, and there does need to be more thought into it. I think um, we've started to go there with a lot of the bullying measures, but there's still a lot more that can be done. So um, I don't know, Stacey, I think for me, it's about teaching my children just to, to be really vocal. And, you know, even if someone comes at them really strong or scary is, is to stand their ground and just try to educate and be like, no, I'm not Chinese. I'm, I'm actually Korean. <laughs> there is a difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and have that conversation because a lot of times, especially with the younger kids, they just don't know. 
or they hear what they hear at home or, or where else they might be getting it from. And so, um, you know, just trying to, to help them have- part of, part of the thing that the opportunity we have as a community here, but communities across the country right about now, particularly given the, the sense of divisiveness that's in play, I think it's an opportunity, particularly here for us in Anacortes, as could be modeled in any other city, is that to have those conversations and not make cultural inclusion so low on the priority, to make sure that cultural sensitivity, and you're, let's say for the city of Anacortes, you are, we're an international city. I mean, we are wonderful. And we got wonderful people of diverse hues, thoughts, you know, genders, expressions coming through. So for those ambassadors that represent our city, it is important and crucial that they represent all of us and that they signal to those people coming through that this is a great place to be and that we understand you and we want you and we want to welcome you here. So yeah, I, I think it's lower on a priority for whether it's the school systems or even the city of Anacortes in its approach, um, you know, to policy making, it, in my opinion, needs to be on a higher rung that allows us to be the best city and represent when we're trying to recruit um, jobs, businesses, anybody that's coming, technical people, they want to know that they belong. And so unless we have people who can communicate at that level, it, it, it makes it difficult to really realize the beauty that's already contained here in our town. So, you know, I know we're, we're getting close to, to our hour and, and we might go a minute yeah. or two, a couple of minutes, minutes past, yeah. because one of the questions I just want us to just begin to tease out a little bit, and right. it's just the beginning, is, is what do you all need from, from, from allies that want to partner with you, that want to, that want to move toward that, that beautiful future um, uh, th th that we hope for? What do you need from allies in, in that process? Anthony, how about you? Go oh, ahead. Yeah. You know, I'll just throw this one piece in. Here's the deal. Um, quite honestly, what we're looking, what I've had to learn about the Pacific Northwest is sometimes people suffer in silence. And being from the South, if, if you are in difficulty, you call out the truth, you call your friends, your friends rally, and it all happens. And so I, I'm a little unaccustomed to that. So what I need from them, is for them to be open enough to me and anyone like me from different hues, thoughts, ideas, reaching out to show them that you recognize them, you want them to be a part of this, and to listen and learn. That's also why this group and the plans that we have going forward for um, you know the dinners, the talks that we want to do. But the challenge has been, quite honestly, as we have galvanized together, what we've also realized is how much pain is in each of us, regardless of you, that we needed to get out, to purge out, and it, to be acknowledged. And then from that acknowledgement, we can find a path forward. It's not about blame. It's really about having, being able to express it and it being okay in a safe zone. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I want to I want to echo what, you know, Anthony said and what I really appreciate about you Anthony uh, in particular is that you are someone who did say to me, I see you and I see that rage and I see that grief yeah. and that mourning and you said it more than once to me yeah. and it really um, uh, just meant the world to me that you said that, that you didn't turn away from that. You didn't oh, shy yeah. away from it. You didn't tell me, you know, oh, you're, you know, you're being melodramatic. And, and so I think for allies, what we need is that, and, and to go to, you know, we spoke a little bit before the, um, before the event started, Terry, about faith. And um, I was thinking about that as, as we move through this conversation. I think what we need from allies is have faith that we're telling the truth. 
that this is not, uh, you know, some story we're making up. This is the truth. Maybe the truth that you haven't known before, you haven't seen it or recognized it. But have faith that this is the truth um, of people, uh, you know, of experiences you have not had. So that would uh, that would be my um, my my request of allies. Another would be to think about you know what James Baldwin says uh. about uh, you know how long do you need for your progress, right? Like I, I'm told, uh. even in my position, you know, with people uh. with love and care, yeah. tell me, you know, it's too fast, it's too much. Yeah. You need to yeah. slow down. Baby steps are fine. You know, at least there are baby steps. And that actually makes me nuts because if you were in the receiving place, you would never say that to others. And so I think that idea that baby steps are enough, that it's fine, that in another 200 years we'll get there, <laughs> people really need to look at the logic of that. Hmm. Dr. King had a great book that was entitled, Why We Can't Wait. And I think that those are some great books. And I honestly think, Terry, Amy, and I'm, I'm, is that at some point we need to do this again and also suggest books, cultural books that help, that could enlighten. I think it's a big deal and it would be helpful. So go right ahead, Amy. I'm, I apologize again. Yeah. I love what you're doing, Terry. I love this thing. And I love this conversation between these brilliant people we have right here. Yes. I just, I just want, to, want to pick up anything Amy wants to add to that allies question, and then we'll we'll probably close it up, and we'll we'll be back. We'll do another one. I think bottom line for me is that my goal is to encourage inclusion and promote tolerance and create an atmosphere in which discrimination is quickly and widely denounced. And so, I mean, whether that be in my smaller community or the larger community. So, in terms of whatever our allies can do to help achieve those goals, right? If wherever you see that you can provide some type of solution to any of those, those directives, that's, that's really where we, we, need, we need you. And I really like what Keiko said, which is even if it's not your truth, this is our truth. Yeah. And so, you know, and just the recognition and um, is, is huge. And it's also part of our larger truth. Yeah. Right. And I think for myself, you know, in the, in the growth and learning I've done, I've had to learn how to be uncomfortable oh, yeah. yeah, and to still stay in the room and, and to know that I'm, that I'm going to be part of the group, even yeah. if I'm uncomfortable, even if something Absolutely. about my own bias and bigotry and yeah. racism, which I have in me, I've, um, is, yeah. is exposed. Yeah. Um, and, and part of that is trusting and part of that is faith, right? Trusting that, the, the other folk in the room who may be people of color who've experienced pain because of, of the bias in me or the larger systems that have benefited me um, will still uh, hang in there with me at the end of the conversation. Mm -hmm. and, and to trust that, um, you know, it does take faith. It does take a leap, but the leap is worth it. The leap is worth it. And our future together is worth it. Mm -hmm. Can I say and one leap, thing on that, Terry, though? Toward Go right yeah. Okay, Keiko, you first, and then Anthony. Yeah, I just, you know, and that the leap is toward discomfort and not yeah. away. That's right. right. You know, for people trying to understand why this is such a big deal, why it's so important, and don't understand, well, and do understand the struggle we are all going through, meaning multi-ethnic, multicultural, every stratus of the pigmentation. We're all fighting to reach that brass ring. We're working, we're slugging and falling day in and day out, trying to get there to that utopia. The only difference is that there are many people at another table fighting day by day, toiling just like you are, identically working hard, but they're working hard to get to the table you're at. And unless you scoot over just a little bit, and make room for them at your table. It's a double fight. And that's what you hear them crying out for. And the reason these discussions are so important among all of us. The challenge that we face, not only as a city, but as a people, 
is to reach out for one another and allow those differences to be celebrated, and to allow people in. So I'm humbled uh, by these three people here, and I thank you for allowing me to have my voice. So refreshing, you know, it, 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 all of your stories tonight remind me of, of an invitation to keep learning, right? And to keep trusting, keep pushing, keep leaning in. And I, I hope that we can continue this conversation together. And I know we will um, in our yeah. in our group. So yeah. I just want to say farewell to everybody here and see you next week. We're going to have Rabbi Alana Suskin from Maryland, uh, Hamza Khan, uh, Anil Afzali, and myself will be talking about what our faith traditions teach about handling uh, challenging times, our concerns about responses to COVID-19 and what faith communities are doing to benefit their communities at this time. Um, you can find out more about our work at paths2understanding.org. You can check out Challenge 2.0, hosted by Jeff Renner on MeTV on Sunday mornings at 7.30 and on our YouTube channel. And also check into our Facts Over Fear campaign, which is working to counter anti-Muslim bigotry in this time. And we just wish you all uh, to be well, to be calm, and to be good to your neighbors. Thank you. Thank all you for listening. having and us. Thank you all of you for we being look forward here. To it. Thank you, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thanks just been everyone. wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Bye, guys. Yep. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Good night. Bye bye.